All right, well, here we are. Thank you so much. I am Lynn Zydowski. I'm the Chief of Science for Alexandria Real Estate Equities, Alexandria Venture Investments. And on behalf of myself and Joel Marcus, who is the Executive Chairman and Founder of Alexandria, a big thank you to the Galian Forum, a big thank you to Bruno Cohen, to Sue Desmond Hellman, to Mike Rosenblatt, and to Roy Vagelis. We are truly honored to be with you here today, and we're truly honored again to host this important event. Today, we're going to talk about mental health in America, a topic I'm sure that will touch everyone in this room, either directly or indirectly. It's become one of the most widespread health challenges in our nation's history. Millions of people in the United States are affected by mental illness, with an estimated one in five adults experiencing mental illness and one in six youth, age six through 17, experiencing a mental health disorder. More than one third of Americans live in a mental health professional shortage area, a community that has fewer mental health providers than needed, and equally sobering, 70% of U.S. counties do not have a single child and adolescent psychiatrist avail available to help alleviate the crisis. Access, however, is just one of the problems. It's one of the many challenges that families face with treatment, including the persistent stigma and public perception of mental illness. Our youth continue to struggle to overcome the prolonged absence of connection and social interactions experienced during the pandemic. Nearly 20% of high school students report serious thoughts of suicide. It has become the second leading cause of death among people aged five or 15 through 24 in the United States. So today, we're gonna to continue a conversation that we began last year. I'm going to interview Congressman and founder of the Kennedy Forum, Patrick J. Kennedy, one of the world's leading voices and policymakers on mental health. The issue of mental health is highly personal for Patrick, as you will see evidenced in this short video. I grew up in an alcoholic family and became an alcoholic myself because it ran in my genetic makeup. In my own instance, my family was the connectedness that brought me back from addiction. And I'm so blessed to have five children and a beautiful spouse who understands my addiction and who supports my recovery. My own experience suffering from these illnesses has made me want to advocate for others who often are suffering from an illness that is treated as a moral failing as opposed to a medical one. That has to change. People often have asked, what has made this opioid crisis so difficult to address? As someone in recovery, I think it's because we haven't addressed it as the public health crisis that it is. If our country treated addiction as a health problem, we wouldn't be arresting people first and asking questions later. We'd see them as human beings in need of help. We're not fighting an opioid crisis. We're fighting an addiction crisis. The only way we're going to get society to think of these illnesses differently than we do today is if the federal government and all its agencies and if the insurance industry starts treating these illnesses as the illnesses they are and stop imposing more onerous medical management practices on those seeking care for addiction and other mental illnesses than those seeking care for diabetes, cancer, our cardiovascular disease. If our country treated addiction as a health problem, we'd be offering treatment to people, treatment that could save lives. Really beautiful. And with that, I would like to introduce Patrick Kennedy, a policymaker, author, and leading advocate on mental health and substance abuse. In 1994, Patrick was elected as a Democrat to represent Rhode Island's first congressional district. He was reelected seven times, serving 16 years. During his time in Congress, he was the lead author of the landmark Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, which requires insurers and employers to cover treatment for mental health and addiction no more restrictively 
than treatment for other illnesses of the body. It was passed into law in 2008 during the Bush administration. In 2015, he co-authored the New York Times bestseller, A Common Struggle, A Personal Journey Through the Past and Future of Mental Illness and Addiction, which tells his deeply personal story. And in 2017, he served on the President's Commission on Combating Drug Addiction and Opioid Crises. He currently serves as the co-chair of the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention's Mental Health and Suicide Prevention's National Response to COVID-19, and is a co-chair of the Bipartisan Policy Center's Behavioral Health Integration Task Force. As a founder of the Kennedy Forum, he unites advocates, policymakers, and business leaders to advance evidence-based practices and policies in mental health and addiction. He is committed to advancing effective, scalable solutions and to shaping policy to combat this highly complex public health crisis. So welcome to the Galen Forum and thank you for your leadership on this. Uh, it's always such an honor to be with you today and always. Thanks, Lynn, <laughs> likewise. So with the Kennedy Forum, your focus is on addiction and mental health. And as many of you probably know, there's this long established link or comorbidity with substance use and mental health disorders. It's estimated that 50% of people who experience mental illness during their lives will also experience a substance use disorder. I know that you have experienced both. You openly share your personal story to demonstrate how we can be a healthier, more compassionate society by building a greater understanding and an awareness of mental health and substance use issues. And you share this story because you want others who struggle with mental health and substance use to know they're not alone in this battle. So I'd like to start today with your personal story. So uh, thank you, Lynn and Joel and the Galian Summit uh, for the opportunity to speak to all of you. Very influential people in this room who can help make this change come about through your spheres of influence. and. Uh, let me start by saying it, it's humbling and it's certainly indicative of the crisis we're in that I get to be the world's leader in mental health policy. Um, I uh, became the sponsor of the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, which uh, guarantees that insurance companies must reimburse for mental health and addiction in the same way they would oncology, cardiovascular disease, diabetes. And I became the sponsor of that monumental bill as the freshman member of Congress from the smallest state in the country and at 27 years old. So if that doesn't tell you enough about stigma, I don't know what else does. Because in Congress, obviously, all the politicians want to put their names next to popular bills and popular programs. The fact that I got to put my name first on this bill tells you everything you need to know about why we're in the crisis we are today. Um, and by the way, the reason I did put my name first was not because I wanted to fulfill the Kennedy legacy of being part of a social movement to help open up the opportunity for more millions of Americans who had previously been shut out of justice in this country, although that fits very nicely because you know that's my uh, family legacy and looking back on civil rights and so many other areas of uh, social progress. The reason I became the sponsor of the bill is because the guy I went to drug treatment with at 17 uh, wrote about me being in drug treatment with him in, and sold it to the National Enquirer during my uh, second term as a state rep. And of course, I thought that was going to be the end of my uh, political career, because um, wouldn't you think so? This was back in 90. And um, I woke up one morning. My chief of staff said, you're not going to like this. You're on the cover of every National Enquirer in the state and in your district. And uh, immediately felt you know, heartbroken, because of course, like everyone else with these illnesses, I wanted to move on and put this illness in my rearview mirror. I was feeling so much shame at having to had to go to uh, treatment uh, up at Spofford Hall in New Hampshire. And of course, I, f I was still dealing with the repercussions of that with my father, who was 
uh, so angry at me for having to go get treatment. He thought it was just going to be the death knell to my political career. And, uh, and, and frankly, he was worried that I was going to end up like my mother. My mother had been absolutely immobilized and disabled by her alcoholism and depression my whole life. Uh, she would live in the back of the house in uh, uh, the bedroom and never come out all day long and, and kind of come out in the afternoon and terry cloth bathrobe after school and I was playing with my friends and all we would do is uh, play hide and go seek with my mother chasing us inebriated. That was our idea of an afternoon game. And then, of course, when their parents came over, I would have to hide my mother in the closet so the parents wouldn't get too concerned about what their children were subjected to all afternoon. So um, in any event, I, I became the champion of this. But as I said, I was terrified when this first came out. And I thought to myself, I had misled my constituents into thinking that I was all that, you know. They, they had voted for me under false pretenses. If they had only known that I was uh, in a drug treatment facility just a couple of years before, they never would have elected me in the first place. And I knew that. That's why I kept it secret. And then, of course, this guy uh, ratted on me. And, uh, and I represented the most Italo-American district in the most Italian-American state in the country, Rhode Island. And uh, I went over to my neighbor, who had been my treasurer, Frank DiPaolo. And Frank DiPaolo was my treasurer not because he knew how to run the books, but because his last name was DiPaolo. And, um, and he was my buddy. And everyone in my neighborhood knew Frank DiPaolo. He ran the largest diner in my district. And at the time, I had been running against a guy named Skeffington. And of course, we split the Irish vote between Skeffington and Kennedy, but I won the Italian vote because of Frank, and that's why I had gotten elected. So I owed everything to Frank DiPaolo, and so I went over uh, to his house because I know he had seen the National Enquirer story and probably was just about to get totally lambasted by everyone in the neighborhood and said, I told you so, that Kennedy carpetbagger kid, he shouldn't have been the guy you supported and everything. So I felt so much... Um, you know, worry about what I had done to him, essentially. And when I went over to his house, and I make, I'm not making any of this up. This scenario is exactly how it happened. He was at his stove stirring his pasta fajol. He would not look back, which clearly told me that he was already shutting me out. But then he paused for a second. I kept saying, I'm so sorry, Frank. And, and he muttered in a loud voice, that rat, that rat bastard, and turned around with his fist clenched. He said, buddy, you want me to do something about this? <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, I, am, I, I kind of immediately understood to be, he wanted to go and break this guy's legs who had ratted on me. That was his, his response, it was viscerally, he loved me. He, he would take me door to door and bring the doorbell, open the door, and, and he'd say, oh, Betty, oh, hey, Lucy, oh, Bob, this is my boy, Pat. You know I've got two girls and two sons. This is the, the, every door we went to, this is what he would say. And Patrick here, he's like my third son. That's how he would introduce me. And I wasn't used to it, but he actually meant it. And he, um, he, I knew when he gave me that response, I was going to be OK. Because, and I was. In the next election, I beat my Republican opponent by 70% of the vote. And it was because the campaign came down to, are you on the side of Pat, or are you on the side of the rat? And that was the campaign. And, <laughs> And in my Italian-American community, they did not want to look like they were taking sides with the guy that ratted me out in the National Enquirer. So I went on, uh, Lynn, to, to put my name to this bill because the, the secret was out. Everyone already knew it. And so when I got to DC, 
unlike my colleagues, I didn't have to worry if I put my name next to the words mental and addiction and had to obviously answer all the press's questions whether I was going to out myself because this guy, Rob Remy is his name, had already <laughs> outed me. And when I say my prayers every night, Lynn, I thank God for that rat because that Rob Remy set me free when I would not have wanted to tell anybody about this if it had been up to me. So really, you get me today by default because I didn't really look for this to be my mantle. It happened to me, uh, not out of my own quote unquote profile and courage, as my uncle Jack would have uh, phrased it. Well, we're glad it all happened. <laughs> and I just want to say, you know, the book, A Common Struggle, if you haven't read it, you should read it. It's really a beautiful book. And there's a quote from the book that I want to read. It said, This is such. Uh, I'm sorry, here's the quote. The Mental Health Parity Act is the equivalent of the Medical Civil Rights Act, a brain disease equal rights amendment, the legal end of discrimination that is at the heart of the stigma of brain diseases. As a politician and a patient and a family haunted by mental illness and addiction, I have waited my entire life for this moment. So that was the quote in the book about the Parity Act, which will be one of your many legacies. So maybe take a few moments. Why is it so important? And it's kind of shocking. It was passed in 2008, and it's still not fully uh, implemented today. Um, so you know, when I left Congress, because I had to, you know, this is a chronic illness. And of course, like most people, I thought, so I've been to rehab. I'm all set, right? And all I ended up doing throughout my time in Congress is migrate from one addiction to the next. So I came in addicted to cocaine. I uh, then had surgery, became addicted to opioids. I then you know, got medication-assisted treatment with Suboxone. I got, finally wanted to kind of wean off of that. And then I couldn't sleep, so I started getting addicted to Ambien. And then I started getting addicted to Adderall because I liked the way that got me on my toes during the day to try to make it through my day and be more productive. Um, and then meanwhile, I went back to drinking, which I had started with. Um, and then I got went back to buying Oxys off the street, which thank God today I'm not in that situation because I'd be buying Oxys laced with fentanyl and I probably wouldn't be here today, which which fundamentally changes this from the old story we all grew up with, with the war on drugs and everything. Because today, it has to be a war. Because frankly, you can't relapse anymore. Now, this, was a, this is a relapsing illness. It's a chronic illness. But I literally see people in my rooms of recovery come, and then I read about them. I literally, you know how the old folks like to read the obits so they can find out who's wake to go to. I literally read the obits every day because it's not unlikely that I'll see one of my colleagues in 12-step recovery. That's how bad it is today. And it's because of the um, potency of this fentanyl and, and, and methamphetamine and the like. So, um, you know, essentially the, the parity law, the reason why it was so you know, wonderful is that it's a narrative. Now, all of you know in mental health and addiction, the biggest problem is we don't have a unifying narrative. You've got everyone in addiction all sees themselves as different, even in the rooms of recovery. Alcoholics don't like the opioid addicts. They don't see themselves as the same, who don't see themselves the same as the cokeheads, who don't see themselves the same as people who, you know, got addicted to prescribed uh, medications. It's it's a mess. They don't. They and in the mental health field, you got the people with schizophrenia who think all of us as addicts are you know really not part of that community because we don't have a real illness. Uh, we did it to ourselves and all of that. And then of course you had the depression bipolar and then the anxiety and then the eating disorders. I'm just saying it's a mess. All the advocates are siloed by their diagnoses, both on the mental health and addiction side. So parity is terrific, because parity is a unifying theme that runs throughout. Because everybody 
was discriminated against, no matter what your diagnosis. And, by the way, it's patently unfair that you pay premiums for your health care, but your health insurance doesn't cover a profound medical problem. And you're paying for that insurance. So why aren't you getting that coverage? And insurance companies shouldn't be fighting for this. This is more risk for them to insure against. Like, I have never figured out why major insurance companies don't write for this risk, go to major employers and say, listen, we're going to cover this more comprehensively than is even required under federal law because we know not only does it reduce total cost of care, but it improves the productivity of your workforce. And by the way, we are funding, um, you know, with the business roundtable, some big think tank which has turned out like Millman or McKinsey that shows that there's an economic benefit in addition to a total cost of care benefit on the health sky side that shows that you know maybe we'll reduce the churn at Alexandria Summit, at, at J&J, &J, at Google, at American Express, which as you know today is an existential crisis for every CEO in the country right now is the, the cost of labor and training up people and losing them especially the Gen X and Gen Z, which is going to totally turn employers upside down unless they can keep them. And if you're not providing good mental health and good EAP, say sayonara to your workforce. So my point is, is it's shocking to me that I have to go around the country and kick the living daylights out of United, the largest payer in this country who's got the worst record on parity. Now, by the way, none of them have got a good record, but they're, you know, amongst equals, there are some that are worse than others. And United carries that de designation because they fought this big case out in the West Coast uh, called the Witt versus United decision, where they literally cooked the books on how they made medical management decisions on whether you or your loved one got treatment or not and whether if you did get treatment, how long that treatment was for, and whether it was the right level of treatment. And by the way, they violated every single society of medicine's criteria for treatment of addiction and mental illness in the process. So not only do they cook their own books, by the way, to improve their own profit margins, which by the way, are already astronomical, um, and by the way, as you all know, they've just gotten stung by the uh, federal government for um, basically overcharging the federal government under Medicare and Medicaid. You know, you saw that they have. Um, so it's like these people are denied care during a public health crisis, cooking their own books, and at the same time overbilling the taxpayer for reimbursement. You cannot make this stuff up. And yet, None of you, none of your organizations, none of our patient advocacy groups know how to stick it back to them so they don't do this anymore. And, you know, because I've still got some pull in Rhode Island, and I know the head of the AFL-CIO in Rhode Island who runs the contract for the state employees, which is the largest, um, you know, group in Rhode Island in terms of a purchaser of, of insurance. Uh, after the WIT decision, I called him and I said, you guys, the state employees, have United. Did you know that they had this case out in California? He said, no, I didn't know that. I said, well, maybe you want to get a, a, a thorough forensic analysis of Rhode Island's health insurance plan as it relates to United. And he said, good idea. So he calls, because Rhode Island's so small, he calls the insurance commissioner and said, can you do a report on United? Because we've got it as the state. And the insurance commissioner, a month later, was zeroed out of the budget. And their staff was zeroed out of the budget. So of course, because I know everybody, I called the guy that I know who will know. And he said, United went to the Speaker of the House, and they got that, that enforcement body within the Department of Insurance zeroed out of the budget. I said, you got to be kidding me. The arrogance of going and asking for that obligation to be zero. So then I called George back and I said, you know, you used to, believe it or not, he used to walk with Cesar Chavez. He was one of his bodyguards from uh, in his grape workers campaigns 
And there's a picture of him next to my uncle Bobby and Cesar Chavez. So I called, so I know this guy, right? He is family. I said, George, you got to do something. He said, don't worry. Next thing I know, they canceled in the, in the re-up of R, RFP, they canceled United's ability to bid for that contract. And I made it known to everyone, this is your future, United. This is your future. Today, it's the little Rhode Island state employees. Tomorrow, it's J&J. Tomorrow, it's Amex. Tomorrow, it's Comcast. Because if I could do a literature drop as a politician in front of, at 9 in the morning, 8.30 in the morning, when all those employees are flooding through Comcast's doors in Philadelphia, not far from where I live, and they are all saying, your third party administrator is united, or one other payer that's not really doing their job. They're going to all go in there and say to their managers who are going to say to the CEO, what in the world are we doing hiring that insurance company that has this terrible record on enforcing a federal law that says nothing more than you got to treat mental illness and addiction on par with the way you reimburse for cancer and cardiovascular disease? But what I'm telling you is stigma is still so strong, I cannot get an army of consumers or advocates to do that for me. Not like HIV AIDS, when the gay community stood up and they had, you know, ACT UP. Remember ACT UP, when the middle of the HIV crisis and ACT UP basically brought every member of Congress uh, out because they couldn't do any event in their district without ACT UP destroying the event and saying you're not doing enough on HIV AIDS. That's what I'm talking about. But because of stigma, I can't do it. I'll just f find out I'm on, on a tangent here. Lynn, I can't, yeah, then, sorry. Then I have to ask you uh, another question. Yeah. <laughs> but I just say politically. My wife ran for Congress last uh, cycle against uh, Jeff Van Drew, who switched parties, went to the White House, pledged his, quote, undying loyalty to Donald Trump. Switched from being a Democrat, who my family supported, to being Republican, who had Donald Trump come in and campaign for him. Anyway, that's an aside. Um, uh, so my wife wanted to organize advocates for mental health because her big platform was school-based mental health. What a miracle. The idea that you'd have community mental health come into our public schools to help our kids post-COVID. Really, a really radical idea, right? Maybe treat, teach our kids how to problem solve, how to develop coping mechanisms. Do you know she could not organize like, like the environmentalists all came out, like they all had big rallies. And of course, her fellow teachers, AFT, NEA, not only did they put in $3 million for her, but there was an event that she went to that they had had 200 teachers there to rally with my wife. My point is, if labor can organize, if the environment, environmental community can organize, if you can have HIV and the gay community works, what in the world is wrong with the mental health community that I had no list that I could call that included social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists, treatment providers, or by the way, families who are willing to sign up as families surviving suicide or, or overdose that could turn out for a rally. Because I guarantee you my wife's record on mental health and all of what she wanted to do was the best in the country, but she couldn't get that rally. So we'll talk right now for the rest of this meeting about all the things that need to happen in mental health, but the bottom line that you need to take away from this is that we're not gonna move this at all without having a strong advocacy community. And I can't tell you that I know exactly how to do it, but I'm just telling you that's our biggest problem. Well, and. You know, I know that you and I often talk about, you know, this is our problem, it's everybody in the room's problem. And how do we normalize this national dialogue? I know we talk a lot about, you know, the old days when you, the political landscape was much more bipartisan. I mean, it's so partisan today. I mean, how do we get the political will, you know, in Congress at that level to really, you know, put this on as a national agenda? Well, every once in a while, I get invited to go on Fox News. So I go on Fox News, and after I do, 
my uh, texts blow up because of all the people I'm in recovery with go, nice job, Pat, great to see you on Fox, blah, 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 which tells me something. You know, this is a bipartisan illness. <laughs> and so my, my town, 70% for Donald Trump. I, I got um, denied communion in Rhode Island by Bishop Tobin because of my support for gay marriage and because of my support of choice. Got denied communion. I go down to New Jersey, I write my book, and my church invites me to speak about addiction. The church is jammed. The head of the choir literally goes and plays in front of, for all of the um, activists in front of uh, these abortion clinics, um, you know, to, to, you know, do all the awful things that they do, to, to uh, harass women as they're trying to seek their right. And she comes up to me, some mass, and pulls me aside and said, Patrick, I, I don't know what to do. My son is in crisis. And because you did that thing, I, you're the only one I know I can talk to about this. And I said, tell me where he is. Tell me wh what the number, tell me this. I, is he ready to go? He's got to go this afternoon. She says, what, 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 what? I called up my neighbor who runs Atlanta Care, and I said, we got to get this guy a bed in your hospital ASAP. Fine, Patrick. Boom. Got him in. Four years ago, we're, um, I'm baptizing my four-year-old baby now, and uh, their grandchild was being baptized. The child of the person that I got into treatment. And they came up to me with tears in their eyes and said, if it hadn't been for you, this day would not have happened. And the husband and the, and the mother kissed me on my cheeks. I could ask them to go to vote for Joe Biden, then they'd do it. And that's asking them a lot. <laughs> uh, but that's what I'm talking about. Like, this is a totally visceral issue. It, I think he cuts through all the partisanship and toxic, toxic world politically that we're dealing with. And that's the reason the president mentioned parity as part of his unity agenda. But frankly, I think the president should have gone much bigger. I love that he did cancer. And you know, that's his big thing. I'm sure a lot of the people in this room love that. And he came to the JFK library recently to talk about his cancer moonshot. Love that, every member of my family's had cancer, but also every member of my family's had addiction and mental illness. And he came up to me, you know, pre-speech, worked with my family, you know, went around, said hi to everyone. I had my kids there for their picture. And I said, Mr. President, addiction is the cancer for today. 50 years ago, my father joined with Dana Farber, my dad was the one that wrote the original War on Cancer bill with Richard Nixon. We've spent trillions of dollars on cancer, thank God. Not taking away from any of that. But if we can do trillions of dollars with, by the way, never looking at the numbers, by the way, we just voted for it. No one would dare vote against the cancer budget. But we need to do that today for addiction and mental illness, because it is gonna take our country down. I'm not talking about medically and public health law, I'm talking about economically. And I, for the life of me, cannot figure out why we can't add the head of the business roundtable, a CEO alliance, to come forward and say, this is gonna be where we put all of our energy, because not only can you not treat a person with cancer or cardiovascular disease or diabetes without also treating mental health and addiction, we just as a nation are gonna be paralyzed by this labor shortage, which I think is driven in large measure to mental health and addiction. And I'm, I'm frankly shocked that we don't have, even Biden, who knows? It runs in his family as it does mine, making this the bigger priority that it could be. We need our moonshot, for yeah. sure.
Um, I want to I want to come back to kids in crises. I mean, you know, the stats are just staggering. Everybody's talking about the pandemic generation. Uh, you know, more than 40% of teens said that they felt sad or hopeless during the shutdown. And we know that COVID only highlighted something that was already happening. It was this, this crisis that's been growing for some time. You know, teen health risks has shifted to include these very complex mental health issues. Hospital ERs are now filled with children in crises. Uh, mental health hospitalizations are up 61% for children under 19. So these past two and a half years have been horrible uh, for kids, and COVID has brought out all of these statistics. I mean, what do we do? So you all, better than most, know how the FDA makes our bio community and our pharma community jump through hoops to minimize the risk profile of new drugs and therapeutics. Technology has become the biggest threat to our public health in terms of the impact on our kids' mental health of anything. And we have never put any of these apps, you know, these technology platforms through any type of risk analysis to find out you know, what the risk profile is on our kids' mental health. Now, I know it's not a drug, but frankly, it's probably creating worse morbidity <coughs> and mortality than the worst drug you guys could produce. Now, I don't know what the FDA equivalent that could analyze social media in the same way we analyze a new molecule for approval by the FDA. So it could be sold. Now, you guys spend billions of dollars to do massive cohort of clinical trials. Does, does the irony not appear to you like it does to me that, that there is no? And now, that's not even including the fact that we have commercialized marijuana and FDA hasn't said a thing. And by the way, as an insult to the medical community, they call themselves medical. Like, and that was the camel's nose under the tent, was de-risking the public profile of the threat of marijuana, which, by the way, it's not your Woodstock weed. I mean, this stuff is 20 30%, even 90% THC potent versus the marijuana I smoked. Uh, 2%. So we're talking about huge implications on our public health, and FDA has done nada on that. And by the way, all of my Democratic friends and governors, including the governor here in New York, just given it the green light, including next door in, in uh, New Jersey. So you cannot be for good children's mental health and do nothing about the impact of technology and at the same time, when kids are feeling ultra anxious, you're going to say, oh, there's a pot shop down the line. You know, it's easier to get into than Starbucks. And you can get an elixir. Does anyone know what an elixir is? It's Fanta Grape Aid with THC in it. You don't have to worry about your parents sm smelling that skunk weed because you can literally drink it now. You can eat it. And that's creating a wrath of, of emergency hospitalizations amongst kids with these psychotic um, kind of symptoms around the country because they're taking very potent marijuana. And by the way, while all this is happening, there is a greater percentage of minority communities getting arrested in Colorado than prior to legalization. And wasn't the whole promise of commercialization, oh, we're going to finally affect a direct uh, challenge to reducing the impact on minority communities of the war on drugs? You know, the bottom line of this shows is that if we were really interested in dealing with the disproportionate number of people of color in our criminal justice system, address that because that is about systemic bias in our criminal justice system. Don't use minorities as your kind of 
Trojan horse exploiting the very real, I think, sympathy that all of us have that we've done this wrong for so long in terms of our criminal justice to justify you making billions of dollars by marketing. And by the way, where are the pot shops? They're all in minority neighborhoods, just like liquor stores. 13 times the number of liquor stores in black communities there are, than there are in white communities. Does my community in Brigantine allow for pot shops? No. Does my neighboring community of Pleasantville, 80% black community have? They have, a, you can't go past a corner without having pot shops at every corner. So my point is, is that this thing has been turned on its head. And uh, if you've got our kids with anxiety because they're disconnected with technology, and now you got COVID for three years, disconnecting them from any socialization. And then they're anxious because they're teenagers. And now they have the opportunity to vape and eat this stuff. I mean, is it any wonder that then they're migrating on to fentanyl, which is, by the way, just hang, looming over the horizon along with this potent meth? So. And by the way, the black market of marijuana is off the charts because now all of the cartels have, can offer marijuana at a fraction of the cost of buying it legitimately. And they don't have to worry about it anymore because who's going hit to hit them up for possession now that we've commercialized? So ironically, We've given more power to the cartels when the whole point of all this was to take the power away from the cartels. My friends, you can't make any of this stuff up. It's really tragic. And, you know, I just want to give a shout out to, there's a new documentary that Ken Burns uh, produced. It was out this summer. You can see it on PBS and I think Netflix too. But uh, it is very powerful. They take 20, 20 young people various ages, various families, racial, socioeconomic incomes, and they interview them. All 20 of these are in serious mental illness crises. And I know that you and your wife, Amy, you know, I attended one of the viewings. It's quite powerful. Um, and you and your wife, Amy, actually took this to Congress. You took it to the White House. You took it into the schools. So I just want to give a shout out there. Really, really important. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, my dad used to take all of us to the Civil War battlefields with my, my cousins and everything. And we have Shelby Foote and Ken Burns, and, and he used to come visit the house a lot, and he loved my dad. And my dad loved him. And so um, he called when he was first putting this documentary together and asked for my help what it, in how to approach this and sent his producer. So, like, I, I look at my life today and say it's no accident. I don't have any. You know, thing. I, I know it's, you know, I'm standing on the shoulder of giants. I got this name that gives me this entree. And, you know, I, I can, you know, go. I know that everybody, I mean, I know people at the White House. I know I can call Nancy and say, can you put this on? Um, I might not be able to call her after November <laughs> um, with the way things are going. But that's, that's, that's pretty frightening, too, because we've made progress on this issue for the last couple of years. And uh, unless we make this a really bipartisan issue, and we have to, and I told the National Action Alliance the other day on a call that we got to get you know, all the big e e evangelical churches behind this, and they will be. Um, Pastor Warren and Kay Warren are good friends. I've been out to uh, speak at Saddleback, and I've gone to other churches. I think that's our way in because they're stewards of the future. They, they have a Christian ethic. All, all of us are children of God. OK, let's put it to the test. And if they come on board, I think we can get um, red state America to really get behind this. And, and if I didn't say the name of the doc is hiding in plain sight. Um, and that brings up you know, this National Governors Association last week launched 
this uh, youth mental health initiative, making it their signature. It was bipartisan with the co-chairs, Governor Murray from New Jersey and Governor Cox from Utah leading the way. So, I mean, really, you know, great to see that because we do need to make it part of our national agenda, the federal level, the state level, and we need it to be bipartisan. It's interesting because, as I mentioned, my wife ran for Congress and she did all these events at school around school-based mental health. And Murphy, right, is from Massachusetts originally, the governor of New Jersey, big Kennedy guy, like grew up with all my uncles and my dad. So he supported my wife in her campaign, but every event he went to was all about children's mental health. Now, I don't want to say that it's entirely because of my wife's campaign, but I think it ha my wife's campaign had something to do with the fact that when the chair of the NGA came around to Governor Phil Murphy, Governor Phil Murphy made children's mental health his signature issue and invited my wife to speak to the national governors up in Maine this summer about it. And so I told her, you know, we may have lost that campaign, but in most cases with political activism, you know, you, you make a momentum here and it comes out on the other side. You can't ever predict, but the point is, if you're engaged politically, things can happen. Not on your own timetable, but eventually. And I, um, I'm thrilled that they're doing this NGA. It's a bipartisan initiative. Governor Cox is terrific. Asa Hutchinson, who preceded him as Republican co-chair, terrific guy. And uh, again, it shows that we can make this a bipartisan issue. So I, I do want to turn back to fentanyl because it's just so shocking. Every day you read something, you know, this weekend in the Wall Street Journal, they actually had a really interesting article about three white collar young executives who ordered cocaine all from the same, it wasn't DoorDash, but it was that type of delivery, <laughs> delivery to them personally here in New York. All three of them, it was laced, the cocaine was laced with fentanyl, all three of them overdosed and died. So, I mean, we just can't get away from, it's just shattering. I mean, death by synthetic opioids have increased 80% over the last two years. Two thirds of the deaths from overdose are due to fentanyl. More than one million lives lost from drug overdose in the last two decades, and I just have to read this stat. That means one lost life every five minutes. So it's flooding our streets. I mean, it's everywhere. It's coming up from Mexico. I live on the West Coast, so you know we really see it on the West Coast. I don't know, in September, if you saw there uh, in Los Angeles, the Unified School District, there were seven students who OD'd on fentanyl-laced drugs on campus at school. So now LA, which is the second largest school district, has put Narcan in all of the public schools, just like EpiPens. I mean, what do we do? I mean, it's just, it, it just seems like it's a tsunami that's come over us. So um, Governor Christie, uh, now I'm a, new, I'm a New Jersey transplant, so I gave a speech to the Hospital Association in New Jersey a couple of years ago. And Governor Christie was coming in because he was to follow me on the on the podium. And it had just come out, he had this viral video where he talked about his mother dying of cigarette addiction, tobacco addiction, uh, nicotine addiction. And he said, that's addiction. We gotta treat addiction. We gotta do this with greater emphasis. And so I, I pointed out, I said, Governor, thank you for what you're doing. If If I were a Republican, I'd be voting for you in this presidential, this was back in 2016, in the primary. You should be the kind of Republican we support. Thank you, thank you, Patrick. So he leaves, of course, he gets asked by Donald Trump to run this national task force, and he invites me to be on it. So we would have all the top level briefings from our intelligence community. My point is, I know where the fentanyl labs are in China, in India, in other countries around the world. And the fact that I know them and they're still in existence is a problem. My, my uncle started the Green Berets, or the first wearing of the Green Beret. Like, I would be no nonsense if you're talking to any premier. If you don't shut this stuff down, it's top priority for us because, and frankly, speaking to all of you, in the, in the greater pharmaceutical industry, 
it's all the precursors. That's where we, so if you can map, as you do, where all of your precursors and chemicals come from to make um, medication, we can do that for fentanyl, all the analogs, fentanyl analogs. Not going to be perfect, but we can do a hell of a lot better than we're doing now. It'll take global cooperation. It'll take public-private cooperation. And it has to, has to be one of our diplomatic um, top priorities. And we can do this. Literally, we can do this. And we have to do it. So I'm all for treatment. That's what you hear me talk about. I'm all for prevention. Let's arm our kids with good resiliency skills. Let's teach them about their amygdala. Let's teach them about compulsion. Let's teach them about how their brains can become hostage to uh, these uh, addictions. And let's do better interdiction. But by the time this stuff lands in the cartel's hands, where they're doing pill presses in Mexico and shipping this stuff, and by the way, shipping means UPS and mail, because fentanyl's so powerful, they don't need to traffic it with huge you know, amounts of logistical challenge. All I'm saying is it just takes political will to wrap ourselves around this. And again, I think this is a unity agenda thing. The President of the United States went out and said, I'm going to do this, this, and this. And I ask, and you do a White House conference, you bring you know, the big pharmaceutical companies saying, we're going to be part of this. You bring some of the big partners who, um, you know, India, and you ask China whether they want to be. I mean, I think you could do something significant. Um, and at the same time, you ought to be bringing all the payers in and getting them to commit to do more on mental health. You ought to bring in the business roundtable and get them to say they're not going to be going for any payer as a third party administrator that doesn't not only follow the law, but do more to invest in mental health for the benefit of our country's economy, because we're not going to have a productive economy if we don't have productive workers. So all I'm saying is at every level, it's going to take political will, which right now you see lots of headlines, but you know, we're not where we need to be on terms of the political will. Well, and we really, the fentanyl, we really do have to figure out a way to stop it, right? I mean, it has redefined the opioid crisis in many ways. And, you know, all of these youth who are getting, you know, all of these drugs, ordering them on apps, and, you know, they think they're getting oxy or whatever it is, and it's laced with fentanyl, and then they OD and die. I mean, it's horrific. Well, I go back to the, the technology priming the brain for addiction. So my dad, when I was growing up, used to say, Patrick, go set a fire in the, in the den. OK, dad. Make sure you put lots of kindling in there. So I'd all get the little pieces of kindling, get that fire going. Technology is the kindling. Technology is the kindling. It's what is lighting the fire underneath this, because you're priming the brain for a dopamine response. If you haven't read the book, read Dopamine Nation. Because it's all about how we spend our time scrolling you know, news feeds, scrolling this and that, because you know, it produces a little, a little ping in our brain in terms of the dopamine response. Imagine that on steroids with gaming. You, know, you look at this gaming that's going on in technology, you look at pornography and what's going on. Biggest thing I had growing up was a spare penthouse or Playboy. And today, I'm terrified for my little boys. They're, you know, 10 and 4. Like, what? I, I'm going to get a flip phone for them. But I, and I'm going to make sure that there's no ex excess computers in the house. But I am telling you. We have primed our young people for addiction. Prime them. So you, you lay that kindling down, then you add marijuana, and then you come in with the fentanyl and the meth. I'm telling you, it should be no surprise. And I'm also telling you now, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse until we really tackle this thing head on. Amazing. And, you know, I know they have the Twitter feed over here, so I'm just going to say, you know, this is all about making mental health and addiction part of our normal conversation. So uh, keep talking. We should do hashtag together for mental health. Uh, as we all know, it's going to take innovation. It's going to take holistic solutions to make meaningful change and to revolutionize the way that we treat addiction and mental health. 
but advocacy is the fuel that powers lasting change. In February, we're going to be partnering with you and the Kennedy Forum to host an Alexandria Summit policy forum focused on mental health as we join hands today and always with you, Patrick, to raise awareness. You are an inspiration for all. We're truly so honored to be with you here today, and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts, your openness, your honesty, the countless hours that you spend. Uh, you give us hope, and together we make change. So well, thank thanks, you. Well, thanks, Lynn. We're going to honor President Kennedy signing the original Community Mental Health Act next October at the JFK Library, and I'm working to make it a Super Bowl of mental health and addiction by publishing. I, we've already published the first member's guide for members of Congress, all the issues that go into every single committee of jurisdiction in the Congress. Just as an example, I get elected in Rhode Island thanks in large part to my labor friends and my environmental friends, right? And my Portuguese community. So I get elected, Rhode Island first district, it's all about defense. We got the War College, Naval Education Training Center, Naval Surface, I mean, we got it all. And so I, of course, go on the Armed Services Committee, and, you know, first couple of weeks I'm there, the labor guys come in, I said, sorry, friends, I'm on the Armed Services Committee, I can't help you, I'm not on the Labor Committee. They said, no, no, no. They said, all these contractors down in the Newport base are violating Davis-Bacon. You're exactly where we want you to be. And I'm like, well, who wouldn't have known? I wouldn't have known. That was their issue. Then the environmentalists come in. And I said, sorry, I'm on the Armed Services Committee. They said, no, no, no. Do you know that DOD has a bigger budget for environmental cleanup than the whole EPA? I said, you're kidding me. They said, no, all of the biggest Superfund sites are military bases. My point to all of you is, I had no idea, except that the environmentalists and the labor people are organized. So they're looking at opportunities in every single committee, not the ones you might think. And in mental health and addiction, we need to be the same. We need to be going to the housing committee, where I guarantee 90% of my colleagues on the HUD committee have no idea how crucial the housing committee is to tackling this crisis of addiction and mental illness. Because if you can't provide stable housing, none of the therapy really is effective. And then we got to go on the education committee and go right down the line. So we're going to produce the first really substantive member's guide. We're going to bring in all the advocates so we unite them. And JFK's um, signing uh, statement was so powerful. He said, people with mental illness need no longer be alien to our affections or beyond the help of our communities. He didn't say beyond the help of our drug treatment centers, beyond the help of our pharmaceutical industry, beyond the help of our psychiatric hospitals or treatment centers. He said communities. And I think that's more relevant today than ever before because yes, we need new pharmaceuticals. We were here with Richard Pops last time. Yes, we need better, more psychiatric beds. Yes, we need all those things. But we also need to tie it in to a community approach as JFK envisioned uh, back in 63 when he signed the original um, Community Mental Health Act. So we'd love to have your support with that. Uh, I literally have all of our friends uh, part of this from NAMI, MHA, and uh, all the addiction advocacy folks, and uh, and would love to have you or any one of your um, folks uh, supportive. So I thank you, Lynn, for giving me this opportunity, and thank Joel, you, everyone. and thank you all very much. Thank you. Hashtag Together for Mental Health.